Uh, so, hello everybody, and uh, thank you Agile Finland, and uh, th and thank you Scan Agile for inviting me here to create and host this event. I'm so thrilled that we will have this first time this public sector track, and uh, I really uh, I'm looking forward to spend the whole afternoon with you all today. So, my name is Mirette Kangas. I'm from Wiley, Finnish broadcasting company. I'm founder of uh, Wiley uh, Agile Culture Accelerator. And uh, for you who are not from Finland, just a few words about uh, Wiley. It's a public service uh, broadcasting company in Finland. It's owned by the Finnish people and it's funded by a special Wiley tax. We meet weekly. 95, 96% of things and daily 79% of things. And uh, like um, Marit said in the beginning of the uh, event, in times of uh, uncertainty, like we have right now, we need an agile mindset more than ever. And uh, this public sector actors they play very important role in the development of the agile culture in society and in the well-being of society as a whole. During this public sector track today, we will hear real stories of experiments, agile way of working, and how public sector can reinvent itself in complex times right like now and uh, i noticed uh, from the chat window that i have some colleagues from yle here as well so if you have to be at the media house fifth floor please come and say hello breaks yes let's move on and uh, we are ready to start the the event our first keynote speaker, he comes from Finnish National Agency for Education. Previously, he has been Minister of Transport and Communication, Minister of Education, and member of the Parliament of Finland. He has also worked as a director and member of top management group in the Finnish broadcasting company YLE. I was also working at his department during that days. His heart beats for systems thinking and networking with the research of systems thinking. And his long-term music hobby, especially jazz and trumpet playing, has contributed to change and agile management and leadership. He thinks that public service needs to reinvent itself to answer the growing expectations of citizens and solve the wicked problems of our times. Please welcome Director General from the Finnish National Agency for Education, Olli Pekka Heinonen. Hello, hello you hello. members, and nice to see you Mirette here on the stage. Nice. nice to see you too, you are very warmly welcome, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy of having this chance of being here. I've been working uh, as a civil servant or with civil service for about 30 years gosh that sounds long although it feels that i just started yesterday and i've been all those years i've been highly motivated with the task of public service and at the same time all the time i've never been really quite happy with the way that we have tried 
to deliver our kind of public service. And for that reason, I've always felt an urge to be kind of finding ways to reinvent and transform um, the public service. And I think now that when we are living in the age with uh, COVID-19, that I think it's quite clear for us all that the world we look at is different than we thought it would be. Uh, I think that there is a special momentum right now uh, to really make the transformation in public service possible. We know that the COVID-19, for example, it is something that uh, it affects all the people of the globe and it affects all the sectors of life and public service that you can imagine. So it doesn't stay on its line, but it breaks all silos. And with that, with all the bad sides of it, it also creates a possibility that we can crap and learn some things that are important from this experience. But it doesn't happen automatically. And I think that the people that are present here at the Public Service Scan Agile 2020, I lay my trust on you. I believe that you are the ones who can really make the transformation happen. And my idea today is to look maybe from a bit different perspective that how the agility can be thought about um, and how we can deliberately make that transformation possible. And uh, in doing so, I think we have to go to the roots. We have to go to the mindset, the old mindset that we are having. And if we take the first slide, I think we have to go back more than a hundred years in time. We have to go to the uh, times of the most influential management consultant uh, of history, Frederick Winston Taylor, who was really kind of a pioneer pioneering at his time with his thinking. He had the idea that we should do the work in steel factories in the way that we describe very clearly the role of each worker. And then we make sure that those workers follow that description and don't change anything, don't communicate with each other, and don't think. It's the question of the leadership to think and plan and the work of the personnel is to obey what they are told to do. And quite often it involved also the idea of fear, of the power that the leadership had over the personnel. And I think this uh, picture which is from the movie Modern Times with Charles Joplin's um, there is the, it kind of crystallizes the idea that humans are part of the machine. Machine is the thing that kind of runs everything. 
And we as humans are actually part of those machines running the world. So that's the worldview that was there behind. And if we go to the next slide, that although we sometimes kind of find the ideas of Taylor um, kind of funny in today's world, it is a reality actually that we still pretty much follow his ideas. We still have the idea that we make a clear division of labor between different um, experts and we create silos where those experts work. And in reality, um, we make it also very difficult for those silos to cooperate because we set targets and performance indicators on those silos. And then they kind of concentrate on their own work and the collaboration is found very, very difficult. So here we come to the title of my presentation, The Unlearning. This is the world that we have to unlearn in order to be able to learn something new. If we go to the next slide, uh, we know the fact that what we see is all there is. If we see the world as a machine, then that is all there is. And that kind of sets also our thinking to what we do. Um, it is actually show that uh, our kind of mental models and our mindset, it's not only about a mindset, but it's actually a physical issue because the, uh, the kind of our way of seeing the world is actually drawn in the synapses of our brain. And if there are those synapses, they kind of determine that what we see and what we do. And we cannot see the world otherwise. If there's a fact that doesn't fit our mental model, it will fall out. And what we do kind of then affects the world that we create. I think it was Churchill who said that um, first we build and create a building and then the building starts to change us. So there's always an inner connection between us and the outer world. And so in that sense, the world we create also kind of um, affects strongly on our mental models. And this is the thing that we have to now do. We have to unlearn the old mental models. And in order to be able to do that, we have to be able to master certain kind of meta skills. And by that, I mean the skills that, for example, Otto Scharmer so in an excellent way describes in kind of three areas that we have to open our mind, that we are open of seeing the world 
from different perspectives and new perspectives. We have to open our heart. We have to be um, having the humility, uh, humility, uh, the the kind of uh, very humid way of seeing the world, and also kind of admitting that we are vulnerable. We don't know all the right answers. And we are open on really hearing others' views. And the third point is that we have to open our will. That we do not set the right solutions in our mind and stick to them. Because that's pretty much that we quite often do with public service that once we have a problem, we jump into, rush into the finding the right solution for it. We think, and then we kind of come up to a conclusion, and we kind of lock down the one answer to that problem. And then we start to kind of implementing it. We start kind of finding the budget for it, uh, the right persons to kind of um, make that one solution possible and so on. But that's not the way the world works today. Because if we think that we have the right answer for the future, one thing is sure. And that's the fact that we will not end where we think that we are going to end. But we have to have a much more agile mindset in order to live in the constant flux of change. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, it is very clear, as you can see in this picture, how clear it is that we are dealing with systems. This is an OECD indicator-based system map of national well-being system. And actually, this is the kind of simplified version of it. And what is important of understanding this picture is the fact that the different parts of the systems are interconnected. Um, and the interconnections and the relations become the essential part of the system. It's not actually the most important thing that what one part of the system does. But what is important is that what happens be in the interactions between different actors. Another thing that we must understand of the system is that the different parts of the systems are changing all the time. So the only way to understand the system is in context. That they must be looked at a certain situation. We kind of quite often also think that, and we talk about the idea that what works, and we say that now we have figured out that what works, let's scale it. Let's copy it everywhere. The problem is with systems that what worked yesterday won't probably be working tomorrow. And it is also the same thing that what worked in one place, it doesn't probably work in another place like giving an example of two European countries 
that first one European country make a decision to create a, a special ta tax for plastic bags. And the idea was that they could get some extra money to the state budget through that and also help gradually um, the, the people to give up the use of plastic bags. And what happened? It happened that actually they really any money in the state budget because the people dropped the use of plastic bags entirely. And it happened in a much, much more fast phase than they ever had planned. And then there was this other European country who thought that, great, they did this change, we are going to do it also. And they created a similar tax model for the plastic bags. And what happened was that actually they quite got quite an increase in the taxation with that decision. And people were actually using more plastic bags because they felt that now they can have a good conscience after paying the tax that they can use the, the, those uh, bags that are creating harm to the environment entirely different situations and, and kind of outcomes with similar solutions. And it kind of shows that, that what works in one place doesn't work in, in other places. And we must also understand uh, with the systems that they bear the emergent property. And the things that are important in the interactions are also uh, kind of emergent properties, meaning like um, things like um, trust, for example, which is essential in making the systems function. It is something that doesn't stay but it is something that has to be fed in the system all the time. And there are similar issues in systems because of the interrelations are so, so important. If we go to the next slide, um, we can kind of see that in the systems, the problems that quite often occur in systems are called wicked problems these days. What does the wicked problem, what is it by definition? Um, it is a problem that you can only understand by prevailing the situation, the context, by careful examination. And the question that how you define the problem also saves the solutions. Uh, with wicked problems, they usually don't start in an exact date. And they will not also end in an exact date. But they are kind of problems where the, there is kind of full of dilemmas in the problem that are unsolvable. They are kind of denying to be solved. So the only thing you can do is to try to find a better balance with the situation. There are no wrong or right solutions, only kind of better or worse ones. We have a saying in Finland and especially in I heard it the first time in, in, in YLE, in our national broadcasting company, that if you are in a live event and you are an um, interviewer, and on that live situation you are asking the person you are interviewing a question, 
and you get a total blackout. You don't remember everything, anything what you should have asked. There's always one question that you can use. And that's the question that, how is this thing arranged in Sweden? Because that's what we always ask in Finland. We compare that, how is it done in Sweden? But the thing with wicked problems is that you cannot kind of find best practices from other countries or other contexts, but you have to create those solutions with the owners of the problem together and the solutions are unique. So that's the wicked problem and these are the issues that we are tackling in with in uh, today's public service. If we go to the next slide, um, this is a kind of a much used picture of the elephant and the way that we try to make sense what we are talking about when our eyes are, eyes are uh, blindfolded. And you can think that actually that elephant is our reality. And we have different perspectives about the reality. And none of those perspectives tells the whole story but they are kind of partial perspectives. And the more diverse view of different perspectives we can create and kind of create the space for a dialogue, for different perspectives to come together, the better sense-making of the reality we are doing. And that's the question in today's world that it's not the leadership who has the right interpretation of the challenges. And it's not actually us in the civil service who have the right answers of our citizens. But it's the issue that together with the citizens, NGOs, the private sector and the public sector, if we can together kind of share our different perspectives of the challenges, then we can find better balance with the wicked problems we are faced with. If we go to the next slide. Um, there are things that the complexity requires from us. Before answering that question, I'm, cause the complexity is a word that you hear used these days quite often. And I would like to say that why complexity matters and why system thinking matters. It matters because we are interested in the outcomes of the system. And complexity and system thinking, it kind of draws the environment that creates the outcomes. And if we want to make sure that the outcomes are the ones that we are wishing for, we should understand complexity and system thinking. It's that easy. And the complexity requires from us kind of three things. It requires from us the capacity to respond to variety, that there are 
many different ways and perspectives of, of looking at the issues. We have to have the ability to adapt to change. I think again the COVID-19 has shown us that we have to be learning of that virus, how it's functioning, um, how contagious it is, how can we protect ourselves from it, what are the kind of uh, solutions to overcome that challenge. And if we don't adapt to the change that we are seeing all the time, we are not succeeding, we are not delivering. And for that reason, the adaption to change is actually the best and the safest way to kind of deliver wanted outcomes. And the last one is the ability to shape the systems um, whose behavior can be reliably predicted. We don't know the right answers that we could budget or lock down for next year. There is no one actor in our society, no one organization that can tackle, for example, the challenges is COVID-19. We know it. We have to work together. We have to bring together the issues of the health side. How can we keep at the same time the economy running, the export and, and import actions functioning um, and, and how we can take care of the more general well-being of the citizens and the society as a whole. These all are interacting with each other and we must make the system functions in a better way and in that way collaboration and working with people, creating the relations, creating the uh, spaces for dialogue are so, so important. Let's go to the next slide. I think there are kind of, in public service, we have had kind of three different ways of, of kind of making the desired change. The first one, if you click, um, then it's kind of using our authority. It's making legislation, it's kind of saying the citizens that you should do this way. Um, that is an effective way of making change if the kind of punishments and the sanctions are strong enough. But that kind of way of making change, it usually doesn't create a kind of internally motivated change of behavior in people. The other way of making change, if you click, is the um, using the reason. That's what I'm doing here. I am reasoning to you why we should kind of uh, think about making the transformation of the public service in a certain way. And again, if my mindset is similar to you, yours, uh, there will probably be a connection. But if my mindset is different than yours, uh, there will be no kind of change in your mindset. I will be not be able by lecturing to change your mindset, but you're kind of letting go of what I'm saying. So we come to the third way of making change, and that is actually learning. And it's learning together. And I'm not talking now about 
the way of learning where the one who teaches has the right solutions but i'm talking about emergent learning i'm talking about a situation where we don't have the right answers but together we are all learning from the problem and together trying to figure out that what could be a sustainable way of going forward and that is actually the process of unlearning that makes it possible for us to change our mindsets let's go to the last um slide um we can jump over this so we have some time for for questions and come to this one this is actually the idea that i've been talking um my whole time now it's about what is the process of emergent learning and this is the process project process that we should make in our organizations in our networks and in our collaboration with the citizens it's the questions that we have to have a sense making possibility adapting to the change and trying to learn what is happening then we have to have the generative conversations which make it possible to have the shared purpose of what we are doing and then we have to have the collaborative um the collaborative in, uh across diversity remember the elephant to have the different perspectives see them as valuable and bring them all together and then be happy with the idea that we don't know the right answers but we are still feeling us safe with the uncertainty um and ambiguity and then to use the system thinking and the reflective practices and i'll end up with that that we in public service we are not always good at kind of stop and see that what we have learned and kind of reflect and see that what went well and what we can do better the next time and to end up i'll end up with a quote that i think it's very very important um with the kind of um agility of the public service if you take the next slide about um experimenting that pretty often we should dare to act and see that what can we learn from that action and it's the it's the uh quote by favorite trumpet player of mine miles davis who says that who said that the note next to the one that you think is bad corrects the one in the front so the idea about making mistakes is not actually about making mistakes but leading us to something new if you listen to miles davis you hear a note that sounds weird and then you find out with the next notes that with that weird note he goes to the different worlds and creating something really new that we haven't seen before and that is the future of public service thank you so much Thank you so much, Olli Pekka, uh, and uh, for the 
participants, please write down your questions to the chat. Uh, I will pick up uh, some of those. We have uh, six minute time. Uh, I, I would like to start with a question uh, for you. Uh, during this uh, COVID-19 time, uh, did you have a, a chance, a possibility to adapt the intelligent loop, the three loop, at your own work? Because everything was changing all the time. Uh, well, well, I think that was the only possible way to kind of stay sane in that situation was the idea to adapt to the change. Um, as I'm working now in the field of education, I don't remember a time when the international collaboration has been so kind of intense and, and strong as it's been now that we mm. all kind of share different experiences. And the only possible way is to understand where we are going, what are you doing, and trying to kind of kind of make sure that you stay intact with what's going on. Yeah. Uh, especially in times when you have uh, highly educated teachers and in different kind of, in very different situation than before. So, uh, what kind of discussion did you have with your colleagues? Uh, well, uh, very many types of, yeah. of, of discussions, but I think what was in interesting in the Finnish context is that um, internationally compared, the Finnish teachers have a lot of autonomy. Yeah. And, and what was, I was very happy with the situation that when we moved in two days time from in school teaching and learning to distance learning that once the teachers had a lot of autonomy on their work they really took that responsibility and they made that shift happen rapidly so the learning never stopped the circumstances for the learning changed entirely but that was the only thing and it kind of shows that when you kind of in the you give a lot of power in the front line to the people who are really responsible of the public service where everything important happens mm -hmm. if the power is there then the ability to adjust to different situation is much much more better yeah uh, there is someone, Henrik Laine, uh, saying uh, that that uh, uh, just agile. You have uh, just created new new kind of uh, uh, sentence now. So perhaps we can use later on as describing uh, this way of uh, uh, behaving and feeling music and uh, collaborating also. And uh, if I take a look of the chat, there is. Uh, a uh, question about the uh, elephant an analogy. How can we change the attitude of the participants so mm. that they start to collaborate instead of trying to convince each other and end up having an argument? Hmm. Uh, now we're talking about empathy. Mm. We're talking about the dialogue capabilities ability to really open your 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 mind your heart and your will and listen to others what others are doing mm -hmm. we know from the from the school world that empathy is something that you can learn i have a good practice actually for it it's a practice that you um, make two people work together and the one tries to imagine what the other one is thinking. And then after a while, the one tells to the other one what he has thought that the other one is thinking. 
and then they see that did it fit at all it's mm -hmm. kind of this kind of way of of kind of understanding each other it's the most difficult thing is to kind of give up of, of your own ego but once you put that in the backstage then you have the possibility of changing the attitude of the participants oh yeah there are so many questions to uh, I would like to ask from you, and also there are several from the audience, but uh, unfortunately our time is running out. I want to thank you, Olli Pekka. It was a pleasure that you had a time to spend with us and sharing your ideas and, and leadership for all of us. Thank you, Olli Pekka. Thank you very much.